Everyone at some point in their life wishes they could travel somewhere else in time. Be it their past, their future, or some point in time they've never been to. But what does that mean? If I could pick you up and drop you in the middle of a forest at some point in history, how would you know if you had existed or experienced this time before? Well, I can assure you, you wouldn't be able to. Because as freaky deaky or impossible as it sounds, every single point in space-time has its own personal time. Two friends are working at a car dealership. Part of their job is to test drive the cars and make sure everything is working. Friend Ted recently has been reading about general relativity, and one day while watching friend Fred test drive a car, he made an interesting observation and explained it to him. It's strange, it takes you five seconds to go around that corner from point A to B, yet if you were to simply go straight from point A to B, you could accomplish the exact same thing in five seconds while driving slower. Fred of course replies with, well, duh, what's your point? Ted ignores him and is convinced something strange is happening, so he decides to conduct an experiment. The next day, Ted shows up with a strange box with a number display on top. Fred is of course confused and asks about it. This is a light clock, replies Ted. It's exactly one nano light second in diameter, and there's a sensor on the inside. Every time a photon bounces back and forth 500 million times, one second passes. I want you to go around the curve in your car, and when you pass point A, turn it on, and when you pass point B, flick it off. Still confused, Fred decides, sure, why not, and obliges. He drives his car around the curve, flicks on the clock at point A, and then flicks it off at point B. As expected, five seconds pass. Next, Ted takes a clock and decides that he'll just drive in a straight line from A to B and make sure that the trip lasts five seconds. Again, Ted turns on the box at A, and then five seconds later at point B, he flicks it off. Sure enough, the clock says it takes five seconds to complete the same journey. But why is this significant? You see, inside the light clock, as the photon bounces back and forth, it travels one light second every second, as light should. So, after five seconds, the photon has traveled five light seconds. However, when Ted and Fred carried the clock, the photon also traveled the distance it took to get from point A to B. Yet Fred clearly had to travel further to get to point B than Ted. That means the photon inside the clock somehow went further than the distance it's supposed to travel in 5 seconds, which means Fred somehow broke the laws of physics. Or, as Ted had been reading, because Fred was accelerating, time was being slowed down for him so that light could behave how it was supposed to inside Fred's clock. But now the question to ask is why? And how? Firstly, I want to throw some numbers and math at you. Even though time slowed down for Fred compared to Ted, the amount of slowdown is so insanely, stupidly, minutely imperceptible, there's no reason to consider it. So let's say Fred was driving 72 kilometers an hour around a curve with a radius of 40 meters. That would give Fred a linear acceleration of 10 meters per second squared, which over a period in which Ted experienced 5 seconds passing, Fred's time slowed down for him to experience this many. I'm not even going to try to say it, but it's basically 5. So yes, it's slowed down, but at human speed, it's it's not even a thing. But why does it change? There's this thing called frame of reference that gets thrown around a lot when talking about general relativity and physics, and basically it's how we describe how we can expect things to react or behave. Some things can look identical in two frames of reference, but behave very differently. That may sound like nonsense, so let's go through an example to visualize what that means. Suppose we are in a large sphere with no unique characteristics or shadows, so there's no way to gauge our own velocity. Here floats a little spaceship that fires projectiles at 50 meters per second. And over here is a plane of glass, and it's rated for projectile impacts up to 90 meters per second. If it gets hit by a projectile moving faster than that, it will break. We focus back on our ship. All of a sudden, the ship starts moving, and its velocity is measured at 50 meters per second relative to our camera. It then subsequently fires a projectile round out of its gun at another 50 meters per second. Stop. What's going to happen? We no longer have a defined frame of reference, so we can no longer predict what is going to happen. Physics can go crazy on us here. Either the ship is moving towards us at 50 meters per second, which means its fired projectile is now moving at 100 meters per second and will shatter the glass plane. Our camera is moving towards the ship at 50 meters per second, and thus the fired projectile is itself only moving at 50 meters per second and therefore won't shatter the glass plane. Or there's a combination of camera and ship movements, at which point, who knows what's going to happen. Therefore, this scenario looks identical to multiple frames of reference, but can have multiple outcomes. Only when we look at the plane of glass can we triangulate relative positions and velocities and create a unique frame of reference. Now we can be confident in predicting what will happen within our physical world. 
The same thing occurs when we talk about not just physical Newtonian objects, but light itself. Einstein's theory of relativity means no matter what speed you are traveling in the universe, light must always appear as the speed of light. So if we were in our car, traveling roughly 90% the speed of C, well then photons traveling inside the car not only travel the distance from one side to the other, but they also have to travel the distance the car travels during that same time period, which of course is a distance further than light can travel in that period of time. Therefore, the car's frame of reference is modified and space is contracted or squished a little and time is slowed down so that light can travel the distance it needs to travel in the correct amount of time. But let's see what happens when we accelerate. To help me visualize what is happening, I like to think of the universe as a big simulator or computer and it calculates how physics and light need to interact for each unique velocity or frame of reference. So before the car goes around the corner, the universe sees that it is traveling at 72 kilometers an hour in this direction, and so calculates the laws of the universe accordingly. But as it starts to turn, the car basically says, wait, now I'm going 72 kilometers an hour in this direction. So the universe calculates a new frame of reference. Oh wait, but now I'm going in this direction. The universe changes its calculations. Wait, I'm going in this direction. And so on and so on. So each time the universe calculates new laws of physics for that frame of reference, there's a tiny little buffer of time where it needs to think. The greater the acceleration, the more buffering that needs to occur to calculate new frames of reference, and thus time passes slower while this is happening. Now this buffer concept is just a way to help visualize what's happening. Whether you want to think of time dilation as time slowing down so that light can travel the further distance in a given period of time, or that changing one's frame of reference and energy requires a little time and effort from the universe to calculate, doesn't really matter. What matters is that you understand the how or why acceleration dilates time, and that you can visualize it. So if we imagine any kind of path and someone drives a car from one end to the other, we can then compare the distance a photon had to travel in a light clock in the car versus a photon in a light clock with a constant frame of reference, and then we can estimate the dilation of time. Finally, let's talk about the time dilation that you're probably most interested to learn about. You may have seen a little movie called Interstellar, where the protagonists visit a planet whose time passes much slower than that of those back on Earth. But why? They explain in the movie that the planet is close to a supermassive black hole and its gravity is the culprit for the slow time, but how does that work? In my last video on gravity, I explain how curves in the fourth dimension causes objects in space to converge with one another. This convergence is what we call gravity, and the stronger or more intense the curve of the fourth dimension is, the stronger gravity is. Because gravity causes our paths through space to curve themselves into each other, gravity is identical to acceleration. This is the idea behind Einstein's equivalence principle. Gravity behaves no differently than acceleration. So, the stronger gravity is, the more we are accelerated, and as we just learned, acceleration causes time dilation as our frame of reference is being constantly changed. So the planet in Interstellar, being as close to the black hole as it is, experiences extreme acceleration and thus extreme time dilation. Now I don't know how intense the gravity near the black hole needed to be to cause such an extreme time dilation or how the ship being right there wasn't affected, but let me tell you, gravity would need to be really bleeding intense. For comparison, every year that passes on the surface of the sun, a year and 67 seconds pass on Earth, and the sun has some pretty strong gravity. So yeah, I don't know if that planet could exist with that strong gravitational forces. Someone let me know. The last thing to clear up is gravity on Earth's surface. You may think, alright, I'm on Earth's surface, I'm no longer moving in an arc or accelerating anymore, so is time dilation still happening? Well, yes, of course. I implore you to watch my previous video on gravity, but in reality, your natural path through space would be to go parallel with the Earth's surface. But of course, instead of going that way, you're going, well, that way, which is a turn or acceleration and thus causes some time dilation. So remember, if it feels like time is slipping away and moving faster, the best way to slow it down is to travel new paths, go new places, and constantly accelerate yourself to new experiences.